What's good, y'all? Your boy Ross back at again with another video. So, I'm gonna check out best of NXT greatest storylines. NXT has had some fantastic wrestling storylines. Some to you know, some could say some of the best produced storylines WWE has ever, you know, put on television, even though it's part of the developmental brand. They had some really good stories that you can get involved and invested in. One of my favorites is the Tommaso Ciampa versus Johnny Gargano feud. I love this feud. I love how personal it got. It definitely reminded me of Triple H and um, and HBK, their blood feud. You know, friends become bitter enemies and the same thing there. I love that feud, man. So I'm sure they're going to probably talk about it because it's one of the best feuds NXT has ever produced, best storylines. We're going to check this out. You know, trying to go down memory lane, man. Show some appreciation and love to NXT. Uh, should be a good one. Appreciate our love support. Let's get right into this one. In historical terms, NXT is still relatively young in many ways, as it's only been around since 2010. But in that period, it's been able to put out some great storylines. Yes, the developmental show has been no stranger to an entertaining angle or two. But what are the best of these angles? Well, that's exactly what we're going to be looking at right now. And where better to start than with arguably the greatest NXT story of them all, the saga of Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa. I just said it. Just said it. It's one of the best feuds, best storylines they have ever produced, bro. I don't know if we'll re be able to recreate that on the main roster, but man, this was so good, bro. That's right, there was nowhere else we could realistically start with this one, as even now, several years on, this probably still ranks as the high watermark of the black and gold brand. Yeah. What made this one so great? Well, it involved two of the best wrestlers WWE had on their roster at the time, each operating at the top of their game. And it all started with them undergoing a fantastic tag team run during the mid-2010s. Once Tommaso Ciampa decided he'd had enough of being part of a team with Gargano, however, things would change very quickly, as following their loss to the Authors of Pain at May 20th, 2017's TakeOver Chicago, he'd attack his now former mm -hmm. partner and become the biggest heel on the brand in the process. How would Johnny wrestle? Honestly, he became one of the biggest heels in the company, bro. I mean... The whole idea of him walking out with no theme music at first and people just booing this man, saying F you are got you know, uh Ciampa, like it was so good. He he was a great, great heel in NXT man. Sling respond to this, well, he'd be out for revenge. And that revenge would eventually yep. come when the pair took part in a series of high profile bouts the following year. Yep. Sadly though, it seemed like the universe never wanted to see this one get the grand finale it deserved because every time we reached that point, outside forces would put a stop to it. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter if it was injury or a pesky worldwide shutdown. Gargano Ciampa never managed to get the satisfying conclusion we all wanted it to have. Of course, none of this takes away from how great the feud was outside of that though. No, even if the ending never fully arrived, the journey getting there was unparalleled in terms of the kind of storytelling WWE was putting on at the time. Mm -hmm. So good wasn't in fact, many people still think of this first when they think of great angles from NXT. But For it's sure. not the only great angle the developmental brand has had over the years. No, there have been others too. Others which have approached this level of greatness. Hell, there have even been others which centered on partners becoming enemies, as can be seen in our next subject, yep. the feud between Carmelo Hayes and Trick Williams. This was good too. This was really good, and it, it kind of, that feud kind of uh, elevated Trick Williams' character for people to get behind him, and now he's one of the most over people in NXT, and I'm sure when he gets to the main roster, uh, man, put him on SmackDown, they can reunite this feud for sure. Yes, you can call this one Shawn Michaels' spin on an old classic because here he took an angle we'd all seen before and made it his own. And the way he did that was to, as Triple H had done before him, take two of the best performers on the show at the time and having them start out their runs by teaming up together. Mm -hmm. Obviously though, this wasn't destined to last forever, so after a couple of years of ruling the roost together, with Hayes serving as the leader and Williams the young Padawan in many ways, it became apparent a turn was coming sooner rather than later. How did we know a turn was coming? Well, after Trick was laid out backstage by a mystery assailant mm -hmm. and Mello began acting a little suspiciously about the entire thing, we could put two and two together yep. and see where things were going. 
Before this turn would come, though, there would be plenty of moments of teasing the fans as Hayes tried to gaslight both his partner and his fans into believing it was someone else responsible for attacking Trick Willie. Of course, we could all see through this, however. And so when Carmelo eventually nailed his now former friend with a steel chair at February 4th, 2024, Day, all we wanted was for the babyface to get his revenge. And he would do just this as it happened because, after beating Hayes at April 6, 2024's Stand and Deliver show, Williams went on to beat Ilya Dragunov for the NXT yep. World title just a few weeks later, with this marking the ultimate victory for the up-and-coming star, as it meant not only had he gotten one over on the man who'd betrayed him, but he'd also become champion too. And with him effectively being run out of NXT at this point, it's left Trick with the whole brand to himself, now free from the influence of Carmelo forever, or at least it'll leave him free from his influence until the two inevitably find themselves back on the same brand together on the main roster. Yeah, bro. When, I'm telling you, get put him on SmackDown. Put him on SmackDown. Introduce the 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 main audience, the the main roster audience, the ones that don't watch NXT or know uh, a lot of these wrestlers' history. Introduce them to this feud. You don't have to rush it. But you can introduce them to this feud. Have Melo be that cocky. Yeah, man. You know, I'm the big dog around here on SmackDown. Even though he may not be in, you know, he has some great matches. Have him portray that persona like you still in my shadow. That perfect. Perfect. Can we expect a satisfying continuation of their story once that happens? Quite possibly, as with there being a better line of communication between Raw, SmackDown, and NXT these days, the transition process is often a lot smoother, and that's been evident in the rise of Braun Breaker, with his rise starting all the way uh -huh. down in NXT during the early 2020s. Now, it should have always seemed obvious to anyone with eyeballs that Braun Breaker was going to be a star, as he has everything required to get over Facts. in the halls of WWE. After all, he's got the look, he's got the presence, and he can even wrestle too. Yep. Back in the Vince McMahon era though, it was never a given that anyone was going to succeed. And so that's why we're lucky Braun managed to find himself going down the correct path right from the get-go then, as from day one, he was treated like a future ace. Need mm -hmm. any evidence of this? Well, how about the fact that when NXT morphed into its 2.0 incarnation and a whole new host of characters were added, he was immediately pegged as the top star of these new faces, with this being why he was pretty quickly thrust into the main event picture when he got a chance to challenge then NXT champion Tommaso Ciampa for the title. And the son of Rick Steiner wouldn't just challenge here, no, he'd win. Yeah. This being something which immediately put the rest of the roster on notice as to who the new top dog in town was. And even then, I wasn't really watching NXT uh, as much around this time, but I knew who he was. I knew they were pushing him, and I, you know, I'd seen the clips, you know, on social media. I was like, "Oh, they're clearly making this guy or pushing this guy to be the next one up." And I heard nothing but great things about him, you know. So him getting to the main roster and they're more or less doing the same thing, it made sense. It, it definitely made sense. Was what happened following that? Well. Braun's rise continued with him getting big wins over main roster talent such as Dolph Ziggler. Hell, at one point, he'd even score a victory over yep. the mighty Gunter, a rare achievement these days. And by the time his run on top was done then, he'd have made mincemeat of just about everyone there. But even when he lost the NXT title, the Georgia native wasn't quite done in the developmental brand yet. No, he still had great heel and tag team runs in him, with his time spent as a duo with Baron Corbin in 2024, mm -hmm. probably representing the best work of the Lone Wolf's entire career. Yeah. Of course, it was always only going to be a matter of time until Braun moved up to the main roster, however, as NXT simply couldn't contain him forever. So that's why in recent months he's made his way over to Raw, where his path of dominance has continued seamlessly. That said, if he wants to be as dominant as our next subject, he still has a long way to go yet, because when it comes to Asuka, her time in developmental was spent undergoing one of the most impressive undefeated streaks in- Yeah, Asuka, they presented her like a legitimate killer. They, no one beat her. In NXT, no one beat her, bro. No one could beat her. They treated her like a legitimate killer. Like, didn't matter who you was, didn't matter how strong you was, didn't matter how fast she was, she was she was gonna beat you. Oscar's gonna kill you. That's literally what they were chanting in NXT. She had some fantastic matches. She's probably one of the most dominant runs from a women's wrestler I think I've ever seen in WWE as a whole. 
She had the Goldberg run, but she can actually wrestle her ass off. That's basically what it was. Modern memory. Allow us to take you back to 2015 for a moment, a period many people consider to be the high watermark of NXT as a brand. It was there that after spending the first part of her career becoming a superstar on the Japanese Joshi scene with her murder clown character Kana, Kanako mm -hmm. Urai signed on the dotted line with WWE and was there immediately rebranded as Asuka. Who was Asuka? Well, as we would soon all find out, she was an unbeatable force of nature. Yeah. Yes, pretty quickly, the woman who at that point in time could very easily have been called the best female wrestler in the world started racking up victory after victory after victory. It didn't matter who was put in front of her. Nobody. Dana Brooke, Cameron, Emma, they all fell in short order <laughs> to the might of the Empress of Tomorrow. So it should come as no surprise then that before long, Asuka began setting her sights on winning the NXT women's title, the yep. title then being held by Bayley. And for as great as Bayley was and is, even she proved unable to stand up to the Japanese phenomenon when the two finally met in the ring with the gold on the line mm -hmm. at TakeOver Dallas on April 1st, 2016. That's right, this was the start of a title run which would go on to become legendary in the halls of Full Sail University, as by the time it was over, Asuka would have held the gold for a full 522 days, a record which still stands to this day. And it's not even as if anyone would beat her for the belt by the time things were said and done. No, the only reason she lost it at all was because she got called up to the main, main roster, roster, where she continued on with her undefeated streak on Raw for a while. Of course, she isn't the only person with a legendary lengthy title. Yeah, they brought her to the main roster. She was instantly presented as a star. People viewed her as a, as some legitimately some legitimate woman that could go in this ring, and then they had her lose to fucking Charlotte. <laughs> So stupid, bro. I just think Charlotte could have did the job there. That's all I'm saying. Like, Charlotte, her name automatically gives you greatness. She's a flair. I think that would have been, you could have built a great rivalry. Hell, it, I've, I'm okay if Charlotte is the one to end the streak. Just not after she does. At least we'll have her win the championship first. Then have her be like a flair, have her cheat, or whatever the case may be. I think that could have they could have built a great rivalry with having Charlotte. Yeah, Charlotte loses. Oscar becomes the champion. And then later on, Flair, Charlotte being a flair, you know, being sneaky, cheating, whatever the case, being the one to defeat her. Could have built a feud off that. A, a better feud than what we got. That's all I'm saying run in the developmental brand however as a few years later the same thing would happen with gunter yep. and his nxt united kingdom title reign yes we never said this video was going to be limited to the u.s branch of nxt as the uk version certainly had its high points over the years too being that it first introduced wwe fans to the likes of rhea ripley tony mm -hmm. storm pete dunn mm -hmm. and tyler Bate, just to name a few that said, of all the success stories of NXT UK, perhaps none are bigger than the man who then went by the name of Walter, as today he currently stands as one of the biggest stars on Raw and the longest reigning Intercontinental Champion of all time. Not that lengthy runs on top were anything unusual to him before this though, because after winning the NXT UK title from Pete Dunne at TakeOver New York on April 5th, 20 Here's the crazy thing, Walter even though, you know, he had a, a lot more weight on him, he still was presented as someone that could beat the crap out of you. He was presented as a legitimate heavyweight. Legit. And he lost the weight. Fantastic shape. And he's still presented as a legit heavyweight that can beat the crap out of you. 2019, he'd go on to hold that particular piece of hardware for 870 days. Ridiculous. A staggering achievement in anyone's book. And it's not as if he had an easy time during this period either because, well, for most of us, navigating a global shutdown was hard enough of opponents such as Joe Coffey, Tyler Bate, and Ilya Dragunov while he was at it. In fact, his match against the latter on the October 29th, 2020 episode of NXT UK was so savage and hard-hitting, mm -hmm. even the toughest wrestlers out there must have winced when they saw the pair knocking absolute Bro, bumps out of one another they were, with the empty arena setting to this one. They were trying to kill each other. They were trying to kill each other. Every match they have, they're trying to kill each other, bro. Making it so that every point of impact could be heard with painful clarity. But while Walter would win that bout, in the end, it would be mm -hmm. Dragunov who took his title from him in an epic rematch almost a year later at Great match. 36, with this finally marking the end of one of the most impressive title reigns of all time. How would the Austrian respond to such a loss? 
Well, as we all know now, he'd head up to the main roster, change his name to Gunter, and there, start a whole new path of destruction. And while he was doing this, he would have a showdown or two with our next subject, a man who mm-hmm. also holds claim to one of the greatest stories in NXT yep. history, as it was back during the early days of the brand that Sami Zayn's journey towards the world title helped establish the entire thing. Now, we all love a good babyface chase for the title angle, Hell, there's a reason it worked so well for the likes of Cody Rhodes in recent years. Mm -hmm. And that reason is because we all like to see the underdog have to overcome the odds and get what they deserve. That said, while Cody is certainly a great babyface, perhaps even he isn't as lovable as Sammy is. And it's for this reason then that his journey to the top in the mid-2010s was so special. All you had to do was look at his face every time he ate a loss during this period, and you felt terrible for him. You just wanted to see him succeed so badly. So when he eventually managed to string a series of wins together and earn that shot at then-champion Bo Dallas then, it felt like the entire world was behind the Quebec native. Unfortunately, though, this wouldn't be Sammy's moment quite yet. No, Triple H was playing the long game with him, and so it was that Adrian Neville, the man better known today as Pac, would mm-hmm. be the one who eventually dethroned Dallas instead. But that didn't mean Sammy was completely down and out. No, he'd continue to work his way back up the ranks until finally, after every hurdle had been placed in his path, he got another one-on-one shot at the gold at TakeOver Our Revolution on December 11th, 2014. And, and it was there that in one of the most emotionally... Bro, it's just... It's taking us back, man. It's taking... Sammy is... He's the perfect ultimate underdog babyface. I said this um, last time we were streaming. I forgot. I think it may have been uh, Monday Night Raw. I said that uh, on the Monday Night Raw live stream reaction. He's the best ultimate underdog babyface. He, he, he has it down packed satisfying moments in that brand's history, Zayn managed to win the big one and at last hold the title above his head. Sure, he would lose it to Kevin Owens pretty quickly after this, yeah. but the title run itself was never the story here. No, the story was Sammy proving to himself that he could beat the champ and that he could be the man, Rocky Balboa style. That said, not all good stories in NXT have been about people fighting over a belt. No, some have been more about the mystery, such as was the case with the 2018 Who Attacked Aleister Black angle. Okay, Mm. this one did kind of involve the NXT title, as the attack happened right as Black was about to take part in a three-way bout for the gold against Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa. But once the current House of Black leader was laid out by a mystery assailant on the August 8th episode of NXT, his focus shifted away from the gold and instead moved on to trying to find out who had dared to strike him in such a cowardly manner. Of course, he wasn't the only one who wanted to find out the answer to this question, though, as over the weeks which followed, fans and performers alike were all trying to solve the mystery, with the only person who seemed to know the answer to the question, outside of the attacker themselves, that was, being Nikki Cross. And since Nikki Cross was completely unhinged and of course. <laughs> word couldn't exactly be trusted, this didn't make it easier for Alistair to confirm things. In the end, though, he wouldn't have to, because after much speculation, on the October 17th episode of NXT, the attacker revealed themselves to be none other than Johnny Gargano. Mm-hmm. With this being explained away as Johnny growing jealous that Black had gotten himself tied up in a feud with Tommaso Ciampa that he felt was his and his alone to deal yep. with. So obviously then, with Gargano now being a heel, it meant that the two would have to have a blow off at takeover war games i remember this man seeing johnny as a heel and once again it still revolves around him and tommaso champa he obviously involves someone else into the mix but the overarching feud is johnny gargano and tommaso champa just one month later a blow-off which might very well have been match of the night and which ended with the babyface getting his revenge in the form of a victory. Mm -hmm. How would things progress from there? Well, Black would move on to other things, such as teaming up with Ricochet in the 2019 Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic, all before then being drafted up to the main roster and spending a period there, too. No, his time on the main roster wasn't a great run for him, but maybe, if, as some have speculated, might happen, he eventually returns to WWE once his current AEW contract runs out, he'll get a second chance at the whip, perhaps this time a romance angle involving his wife, Zelina Vega. After all, we all know romance angles in wrestling can work well. NXT proved this with their index story during Uh, the latter days of the black and gold era. (laughs) What was the story to the people were really getting into this one? Like, 
people were invested into this. <laughs> this one? Well, it was that in early 2021, relatively normal member of the way, Indy Hartwell, began finding herself to be the object of Dexter Loomis's affections. And since Loomis was a mute, apparent serial killer whose only way of showing love was to act in the strangest manner possible, it's understandable she was a bit freaked out by this at first. As time went on though, Dexter began slowly winning over the object of his affections with his unique <laughs> charms, and this eventually led to the two becoming a bit of an on-screen item, something which, at least initially, drew the ire of indie stablemates Johnny Gargano, Candice LeRae, and Austin Theory. Of course, eventually they'd come to love Loomis too though, and so it was after months of a whirlwind romance, everything would culminate in a marriage proposal on the August 17th episode of NXT. But in a twist to the way the Marriage proposals in WWE is always, just in wrestling in general, especially in WWE, is fucking hilarious, bro. Like, we're really, we're really about to propose in the middle of this dirty ass ring after people didn't sweat it and, you know, had 15, 20 minute matches. Yeah, we're about to propose right here. Yep. We're doing it. We're doing it live. Does the family need to be here? Nope. They can watch on TV like the rest of us, like everybody else. <laughs> These things usually go, it wouldn't be the man who did the proposing here. No, instead it was Hartwell who made her intentions clear, with the wedding being set to go ahead from there on September 14th, <laughs> the date of the first NXT episode under the new 2.0 rebranding. That's right, it was a quite a way to kick off a new era, and while it wasn't exactly Randy Savage and Miss Elizabeth, yeah. it was still a memorable segment <laughs> and a worthy conclusion to one of NXT's most memorable angles over the years. Sadly though, this would also mark the beginning of the end for the couple, because pretty soon after their marriage was made official here, Loomis would find himself out of a job, and so the two would be separated once more. But even if it was a sad way for things to conclude, Anyone who's spent any length of time watching wrestling should know that breakups are the way things so often go. Mm -hmm. After all, it's the way our next great angle eventually ended, with that yep. being the story of the Undisputed Era. Yeah. Yes, back in the latter half of the 2010s, there was no more dominating force in NXT than that which was made up of Adam Cole, Kyle O'Reilly, Bobby Fish, and Roderick Strong. And the reason for that was because when all four men were paired together, their combined skills made them nigh on unbeatable. Yes, it didn't matter who was going up against them, mm -hmm. the Undisputed Era almost always stood tall. And this was why at one point they were quite literally- Easily one of the greatest factions WWE's produced, bro. Undisputed Era, bro. They were fantastic, bro. <laughs> I love the Undisputed Era, man. Really dripping in gold when Cole was NXT World Champion, Roddy the North American Champion, and Red Dragon the Tag Team Champions. Unfortunately though, as with all good things, this one had to end eventually, and so it was that after years of making things like war games their own, dissension began to sow itself amongst the ranks of the stable mm -hmm. when Kyle O'Reilly went on something of a main event singles run in 2020. How would Adam Cole respond to both this and O'Reilly's subsequent attempts to have Finn Balor join the UE? Well, with extreme jealousy. Which was exactly why at TakeOver Vengeance Day on February 14th, 2021, he just about kicked the yep. Vancouver native's head off with a super kick, a move which formerly marked the downfall of the stable. Mm -hmm. Yes, now with Cole and O'Reilly at odds, it was left to Fish and Strong to choose sides, with this all eventually becoming too much and causing the whole thing to implode. Sure, all parties involved would eventually try to rebuild these friendships when they later moved over to AEW, but even that couldn't last forever it seems, because with the wounds from that initial attack running too deep, we're now looking at a stage where it doesn't look like we'll ever see all four members of the Undisputed Era on the same page again. Yeah, nah, it, it, it didn't. Injuries, and it, it just, it didn't hit like it should have as well. Like, it, it's very unfortunate. To be honest with you, so but they're, they're the undisputed air running NXT, whew, fantastic. Needless to say, then that's a crying shame because when they were at their peak in NXT during the late 2010s and early 2020s, there was quite simply no one who could match up to them in terms of either their ability in the ring or their sheer force of strength and numbers. Mm -hmm. So, pour one out for the UE, arguably the greatest <laughs> stable to ever do it on the developmental brand, yeah. Well, that is if we don't count our next group as an official stable, of course, because while they were never all on the same page in kayfabe, the bonds that tie the four horsewomen together remain strong throughout their entire time on the black and gold mm -hmm. brand. And this led to one of the best overarching stories in the show's history. Now to tell this one properly, we need to go back to December 12th, 2012. That was the date Sasha Banks had her first televised match against Paige 
and in the process became the first of the four horsewomen to appear on WWE TV. Of course, she wouldn't be the only one there for long though, because over the course of the 12 months which followed, Charlotte Flair, Bayley, and Becky Lynch would also join her. And with each of these four performers quickly proving themselves to be stars in waiting, it led to a heated competition breaking out to see who would reach the top first. Not that they weren't friends behind the scenes though. No, so close would the quartet become that at one point, Charlotte's father Ric Flair would bestow upon them the name of the four horsewomen. Mm -hmm. On screen though, things were far less civil as each wanted to be the top dog in the division. And this all memorably climaxed in a four-way bout between them at TakeOver Rival on February 11th, 2015, to this date the only time that match has taken place. Who won this one? Well, that would be Sasha Banks, with her victory here spinning her off into even better singles bouts against the likes of Bayley and Lynch. But then all four of the horsewomen could be counted on to have a great singles match yeah. with one another by then, and this was something they proved again and again. And this is one of those things where, you know, Paige was kind, she ushered in, well, not even Paige, AJ Lee, you know, you gotta put AJ Lee in that situation, Paige in that situation of ushering in, um the the renaissance the, the revolution the women's revolution but these four ladies right here they personified that because you knew they're gonna get called up and this is gonna be the future of women's wrestling the gone of the diva era and you know like i said aj lee is one of those pioneers that were really trying to get rid of that diva era and the same thing with Paige trying to push women's wrestling to actually go out there and wrestle and not to say that women's wrestling wasn't always a thing it just wasn't featured as much you know we know back in the day it was all about the bra and panty matches and you know the women barely having any clothes but there were some women wrestlers that would try to give whatever five minute ten minute block they had they tried to do the best they could but it wasn't you know focused as much it wasn't until you know the AJ Lees of the world, the pages of the world, and then what they were doing in NXT, that's when they really started to focus on it because they could see people are actually caring about what's happening here, as they should. So, Right up until the point their era on the developmental brand came to a figure at end when three of their members, namely Banks, Flair, and Lynch, were called up to the main roster on the July 13th, 2015 episode of Raw. What happened after that? Well, they just kept on dominating, now on the main roster instead. And yeah. when Bailey eventually joined them on the A-Show, their reign of dominance only got stronger. That said, had they not first proven they could be such stars with such a great story in NXT, then things might never have reached this point. But then that just goes to show the importance of the developmental show and its ability to captivate us with some of the tales it's weaved over the years. And you know, Asuka became a part of that then you got bianca you got Rhea. you know we have you know a plethora of women out there that came from the nxt brand developmental brand and now you can say they're at the top of the company people want to see them wrestle people want to see them get in the ring and whoop ass and it's just, it's awesome to see you know and once again NXT has graced us with some great, great gems, great storylines, great characters. This was a very dope video. Comment down below. Let me know your favorite NXT storyline of all time. If it wasn't listed in this video. But I appreciate all the love and support y'all showing on the channel. Road to 150K. Appreciate y'all kicking with me. See you on the next one. Peace.